When Apple announced the iPhone 14, a lot of people were disappointed that it wasn't a big upgrade over the 13 series. Yes, technically we got a slight processor upgrade and a camera upgrade, but it felt even less than a typical S year for iPhones. I was more interested in the iPhone 14 Plus, which was the first opportunity for those who wanted the bigger screen of the iPhone 14 Pro Max without paying for the additional camera and whatever other internals. There's some features that we'll talk about. But I was pretty impressed with the feature set of the 14 Plus, even if it wasn't a big processor upgrade over its predecessors. And so I wanted to give it a shot. So for the last few weeks, I've been checking out the iPhone 14 Plus, and I've been pretty impressed, and I think it might just be the phone to go with this year. Let's talk about why. This is an OISO and this is the iPhone 14 Plus review. Let's start off with the design. While the glossy glass back panel of this does attract fingerprints, it's not really as obvious on this brighter colored blue model. And the frame thankfully doesn't show off fingerprints like my iPhone 14 Pro that I reviewed a couple weeks ago. This semi pale blue color that I got is, is fine. It's not the brightest color. It's kind of similar to the Sierra blue from the iPhones Pro last year, but it's, it's nice, it's a nice color. And I was particularly surprised with just how thin this phone was. I can definitely notice the difference in thickness relative to my iPhone 14 Pro. It feels more like a modern device, but obviously that might count against it when it comes to battery life. The big difference between this and the Pro Max model that you'll see immediately is the screen. Unlike the Pro Max and Pro series, there is no dedicated dynamic island, instead sticking with the old notch, which many people will be disappointed about. I'm actually happier. I was incredibly surprised with just how much more screen real estate I had on this phone versus my iPhone 14 Pro. Yes, the screen was larger, but also there was significantly less space taken up by that massive, massive hole in the middle of the display. Yes, technically I don't have some of the features of the dynamic island, but I didn't really miss them all that much. Now, not everyone will feel that way. I specifically talked to a number of coworkers who have upgraded to the 14 Pro series from the iPhone X and other models, and they were per personally like very impressed with how the dynamic island worked. They actually really liked some of its features. So, you know, your, your results may vary, but personally, I really enjoyed screen real estate. I'm not typically a big iPhone guy. I prefer smaller iPhones that fit my hand, but considering neither the 14 Pro or 14 regular 14 model fit comfortably in my hands, if I'm going to use two hands on my phone, I might as well have a phone that actually has a larger screen, in which case I actually enjoy the extra screen real estate of the Plus. On the screen side, the other downside of going with this versus the Pro Max or the Pro is the fact that you no longer get the always on display. And personally, I think the always on display is the biggest and best feature to come to the iPhone this year. I think it's the one most worth it. What is carried over is the fact that this is also only activated using eSIM rather than traditional physical SIM cards. If you aren't already aware, when you're upgrading to this or any 14 model in the United States, you no longer have a physical SIM card that you slot into the SIM tray, instead having to activate it basically over the network. And it is a mixed bag for people. Some people actually had perfectly fine experiences where they were able to transfer over their SIM very simply. I was unfortunately not one of those people for my 14 Pro and now for the 14 Plus, which took me a good 30 or 40 minutes talking with my carrier in order to get properly, get it to work properly. My carrier notably is Google Fi and different people have had different experiences, but the bottom line is the carriers weren't really ready for this transition. And hopefully over the next few years, they will, it will be a lot more seamless transition. The experience that wasn't too different between this and my 14 Pro was in the camera experience. Yes, technically this has one fewer cameras and the primary sensor is technically worse because it doesn't have 48 megapixels. But in general, the camera quality on this phone was just as good in most cases to my 14 Pro, which is to say, Great, great photos and great videos can come from this device, but I will say that I prefer the kind of color science that comes out of most Android phones over this device. One thing that this definitely had over my 14 Pro was in battery life. Now, granted, the 14 Pro is not the same size, so I wouldn't expect the battery life to be similar, but the 14 Pro was a step down in battery life relative to my 13 Pro, whereas this was a big step up in battery life. One Saturday, I left this in my pocket for eight straight hours and it did not lose more than 5% of its battery. 
I, by the end of the day, it was like I was getting ready for dinner and it still had like 93% battery life left, which granted that is standby time. It's not active usage, but even in active usage, I was easily able to get a solid two days of battery life out of this phone. And that was incredible. Which of course leads to the question of performance, right? Because technically this does have the last generation chip in it. And frankly, I really don't care. Like we've known that iPhones are incredibly fast for years and years now, and the last generation chip works just as well. So why feel like you need to pay for that extra performance, which is a very small jump this year anyways. I'd rather have a massive amount of battery life and then maybe a little bit lower price. Which brings us to the price. $900 is still a lot, a lot of money. And many of you down in the comments might point out that if you go for the iPhone 13 Pro Max from last year, you'll get a similar screen size, similar footprint, the same processor, and one more camera for what could be a substantially lower price depending on what price you could get it for refurbished. I completely recognize that. I totally love the refurbished market and I think it's the place to go for anyone. But a lot of people choose not to buy refurbished phones. They don't wanna deal with a lack of support or a warranty or anything like that. They wanna have, they wanna be able to walk into an Apple store and buy whatever phone's available at that time. If they're looking for the best phone available to them, they can either pay $1,000 for an iPhone 14 Pro, which I didn't like, or $1,100 for a 14 Pro Max, which is pretty dang expensive, or they could pay $200 less for this, which technically has a worse processor, technically is missing some of the features, but if the majority of iPhone users just want the best iPhone for them at a reasonable price, and people don't need some of the new features, then the 14 Plus is a great option. I was really excited by a lot of the features brought on by the 14 Pro series because they are features that Android has had for a long time and I think iPhone users should have them too. But after the fact, I realized that the only feature that I really care about is an always on display. And even that Apple still, still needs to work on. So there's my recommendation. If you want a big iPhone, go for the 14 Plus. Skip out on this year's Pro model and wait for the next couple of years where hopefully Apple will bring those same sort of Pro features down to the regular model. Thank you for watching NOISO. I hope you liked this short review of the iPhone 14 Plus. If you did, be sure to let me know down in the comments, get subscribed, and like this video because it is very, very helpful for the channel. I'll catch you in the next one.